Okay, maybe we can get our hands uh, a bit dirty soon after this crash course introduction, I guess. I don't know if there are no questions. I, I made the, the stupid assumption last year of assuming that maybe Python had become mainstream here as well. You know that in other places now, and a lot has been written about this, by the way, in, in other places, uh, Python has been, uh, is, is being used as an introductory programming language. Right? Uh, I know the, the, my alma mater uh, started doing this, I think, two years uh, into my, a year into my master's, I think. And it's, I seem to think it works quite well. Before then, they used to use Java as an introductory language, but what they do now is they do that, they introduce students to Java at second year. Right? So pretty useful language, I suppose. So I made the assumption that people would already know Python, which is why I did a poll last time to find out, and I think it was only one person who has some um, knowledge of Python, but that's fine. It's a simple language, I assure you. It's, it's very simple, I really like it. Uh, I mostly use it for scripting myself. Nothing more than scripting. <clears throat> but anyway, so I thought I'd split up this uh, lecture session into three main parts. We shall first of all, again, people struggled with, I don't know how many people have used Jupyter Notebooks before, Jupyter Lab, or Google Call Lab. It's a good thing that I included this. Uh, most of the, the, the code that I'm going to be sharing are uh, shared here, right? Um, and it tends, well, and then afterwards we'll look at, we'll dive into Python, just look at the bare basics to get us started. The reason, by the way, we're going through Python is very soon the next lecture starts, uh, the, the, there's a bit of code there, and we don't want people to get lost in, when they're reading through the code, right? So that's the idea behind this. And then we'll just look at a few core modules, the Python um, modules associated with this. All right, so just a sneak preview of this thing called Jupyter Notebooks. If you look up online, I guess what we're going to be looking at is so-called Jupyter Notebooks Classic. I recently discovered that uh, Jupyter Lab, one word, is almost becoming mainstream, right? Uh, but the functionality is more or less the same anyway. So if you, but it has fancy features like you can open tabs apparently or something. I, I like Jupyter Notebook Classic myself, it's just fine, right? And what we're going to do is really just walk through the simple interface so that you're able to execute the code on your own, right? And then just walk through the three key types of uh, content that you will find in these notebooks when I'm sharing them. And in fact, when you're looking up information when you come across these notebooks, these are the three different types of content that you're going to find. Uh, all right, so it's a, I guess the motivation behind this is this notion of reproducible research. Um, uh, uh, so with something like Jupyter Notebooks, I can share with you things that I've been working on and hope you should be able to re-execute whatever it is I did and get the same, if not similar results, right? Or similar, yeah, no, it's exact same one, except somewhat closer, uh, the results that are somewhat closer to what you're doing here. <clears throat> right, so you can view a notebook as nothing more than, uh, it's a web application actually, you run it as a web application, um, and, and really this web application contains uh, content, texture content, live code, right, so it could be Python, or uh, if you've incorporated some sort of like shell scripts there, you can run shell commands, um, um, visualizations and equations if you're working on some math problem, for instance. Um, I like the fact that you can actually, I don't know if you can see this, but you can actually integrate LaTeX within this, right, so it's a lot easier to work with equations. And then you can also visualize things within the, the notebook itself, right. Um, Without this, I, I guess you'd have to do some of these things separately. Think about this for a second. You'd have to, uh, I don't know, the live code would probably be in some external file, the equation, some document or something, the visuals are separate as well, right? But this integrates everything into just one um, unified component. Um, and then it turns out that if you look at this, this is what they call the kernel, right? So uh, in as much as most people use this for Python 3, but you can, you can actually use other kernels that will allow you to run languages like R, right? Um, so you just have to install the kernel itself. <coughs> right, and, and I thought I'd mention here, in case you, you struggle installing this or something, the alternative here, this is how you install it, but the alternative is Google Collaboratory. So it's like, um, uh, it's Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud, right? 
so you just have to go here, um, and then I guess you just have to associate your Gmail account, and then you have you have this interface, which is more or less similar to to the Jupyter Notebook Classic here. The only difference is, like, I, I get to do more here, and in certain instances, I find myself working offline, so I wouldn't want to um, to be connected. The times when maybe I might not have an internet connection, the obvious things here, right? There's no way of working offline like you can with Google Docs or Google Sheets here. <coughs> right. Um, and then in terms of the UI, really, it's a very basic thing. The key thing is that you need to pay particular attention to are the cells here, which is where you write the code and the text or content, right? Uh, and the shell, shell commands, and the, also the magics. So this is an example of a cell. And uh, executing this cell when you write code like this is as simple as just pressing the run button or shift enter, right? And then boom, the result comes up. For the most part, the result will be immediately after the cell um, where you executed, uh, uh, where you ran that command from, so it will appear right below here. Except for for, for things like these, I had to install like um, an additional component, is it plugin? So you won't really see output. This enables me to generate PDF files that I can share. Um, <clears throat> right. So the, the other things here, like the things like the toolbars. I mean, you can create a new. Uh, the obvious things, right? Open a, a new notebook. You create a new notebook. You run the entire notebook as a whole, right? So you go to, uh, and I guess maybe it would be nice if I, <clears throat> if I, when we're running through the interface, if I, <clears throat> right, so, when you, maybe actually I should probably run uh, something that has uh, that nice content. something from last year. That would be nice. So when you run the, you, when you run Jupyter Notebook for the first time, I mean, this is what you're presented with, and so all you do is you execute one of the notebooks. The notebooks are, have an extension of uh, IPYNB, right? IPython Notebook. It previously used to be called IPython. <coughs> right, so what I was saying is um, once you write your commands, uh, you can use this menu items of the toolbar to actually do a number of things. So for instance, instead of individually running, so this is called texture content, I execute it, this is what happens. This is Python code, this is live code, I execute, let's look at something that has out output here. There we go. Uh, I, I'll reset this. So we see what's happening behind the scenes. So notebook for the first time. Uh, I can execute it cell by cell, right? When I execute a part that has live code, I see the output immediately afterwards, right? So I can inspect certain things. Uh, in this case, uh, I'll explain this. I'm just running a shell command head here to just view the file, the CSV file. But in this cell, I have a Python code, right? When there's an error here because I needed to import those libraries and packages. So I run that and I see output, right? But in certain instances, what I was saying is um, certain things will not give you an output. Like if I run the import statements here, I'm not getting any output, it's fine, right? Um, and then you have fancy things like uh, if you go under kernel, you can, because this notebook has a whole bunch of things, perhaps what I might be interested in is rerunning everything. Like if, I'm, if, if this notebook is a representation of a project I was working on and I want to re-execute everything from top to bottom. All I do is, instead of individually running all the different cells, I go to kernel and then I will say restart and run all. And then this will run everything. I, I probably shouldn't do this because I know some things take a lot of time here. Right? Um, you can shut down, you can change kernels and fancy things here. You can insert new cells. I mean, this is trivial stuff. Uh, I hate someone sign. I know it's trivial stuff, but uh, 
Okay. It makes life a lot easier, by the way. Uh, notebooks. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then when it comes to content, right? Remember, I s we say the different types of textual content that will probably come across is text, uh, visuals, and uh, live code. So for textual content, it turns out that, and we're in luck, uh, if you ever want to work with this, it's Markdown, right? So if you've edited Wikipedia before, no problem. If you, you use those funny fo fancy formatting in WhatsApp, like underbar text underbar, so that it's, ital it's in it italic or, uh, or asterisk, asterisk, and then text so that it's bored, that's Markdown, right? It's trivial stuff. It's just like HTML, actually. You're looking at structure of the content, right? So uh, for the most part, I mean, what you'd have is like something similar to what I have here. Like if you're trying to describe the process, right? You write down the content on top there. Um, write it down in Markdown. So this would be like a link, right? Hyperlink. This would be, uh, it would be an, a, a what? An ordered list, right? This would be paragraph. This would be heading one, right? <clears throat> so this is it. It's simple stuff, really. Uh, I don't think Markdown is different. You'll probably be able to, if you haven't worked with Markdown, if you read it up, the mind is quite small. Tonight, you'll know Markdown, right? Uh, so if you are wanting an ordered an, an ordered list, this is what you do. Um, I know this is boring. So ordered list, right? Simple stuff. Uh, the Python code, though, I guess is somewhat slightly different. So once we get through with Python, you realize that um, the same things that you'd normally write in uh, a, a Python module, a dot py, py file, a dot py file, are the same things that you put here, right? That same code. It's just like copy pasting. Right. The shell commands are somewhat different though, um, because what you have to do is you prefix them with um, an exclamation mark. So if you're working on Linux and you are wanting to run ls, for instance, it has to be exclamation mark and then ls. Uh, and really you realize that that's important, especially once you're going through the exploratory data analysis phase, because it's not always the case that you'd be working with fancy things like pandas. In certain instances, if you remember the examples I showed us, which was somewhere uh, here, I guess, uh, here. I'm trying to, uh, I mean, uh, before I import this, before I, I, imp I, I use uh, the pandas library here, I'm just trying to make sure that the data I'm working with uh, makes sense. So I do a sneak preview of that, and I can run fancy other fancy uh, commands like I want to see uh, I don't know what I did here. No such file. Tell. I want to see the last couple of lines there. I don't know if that thing came up. Can't see. I shouldn't have done that, it's taking long. But the bottom line is the same commands, the same shell commands that you are used to are the ones you run here. Um, and it turns out I think there are magics that are, uh, there are commands that are associated with bash that you can access as well if you're using Windows, right? That's besides the point. I don't know why this is taking long though. <clears throat> the key thing though is when you're running these shell commands, you just prefix the command with an exclamation mark. Uh, and then there are also cell magics that you might be interested in. Um, I'm not sure uh, in what instances, like if you want to integrate HTML, for instance, there's an HTML magic, and what you do is you use two percentage signs, right? So to give you an idea of the sort of magics that are available out there, I will cancel this kernel. Uh, we start and... Right, so these are the different um, magics that I have access to, right? I don't know if HTML is here. I can't see HTML here. I wanted to use HTML as an example. Okay, there we go. Um, let's see if I'll be able to do something here. So if I want to... I wonder if this will work. I hope it does work. Ooh, no. I 
don't know why it's not working. Right, so it's supposed to be on a new line. So uh, all these different things that are here, uh, the magics that you could probably use. A useful, probably a useful thing that you're going to find yourself using is the time it, right? So if you're trying to, um, you're executing some command and you're trying to measure how long it's going to take the execution itself. You time it the first time, and then you time it at, at the end here. And then you have a sense of how long it takes, right? Um, I don't know which other magics I've used here, but fancy things, anyway. Besides the point. Um, and then the visuals, uh, for the most part, the visuals, I mean, visualizations can be done in HTML. Uh, so because you can run HTML code, you can literally make reference to an image source out there, right, and integrate it into here. But the visualizations that we're going to end up using here are the graphs. And the way we generate graphs is we'll predominantly use Python by taking advantage of matplotlib, right? So this is generated by matplotlib. These are the things that we're going to look at. This is important for us because once we look at evaluation, we want to be able to generate those uh, uh, fancy visualizations like uh, confusion matrices, right? The confusion matrix, um, uh, the rock caves, right? To, to try and figure out which of the linear algorithms is superior, right? So, but you get to, to put all those different things into this component here. All right. Uh, I hope this was okay as the crash course introduction. Do you think we can, uh, instead of installing Jupyter Notebook, the, there's a, the, these instructions here, we don't have time to do that. But do you think that maybe as I'm running us through this Python thing, there are some exercises in here, but do you think maybe we can, in the process as we're doing this, we can attempt to, to do this uh, so that we're able to follow through with examples because it turns out most of the things that I'm talking about here we can do using Google Collaborator or Google Collab. So you, uh, I do encourage you to, hmm. <coughs> so Jupyter, no, Google Yes, yeah, so both the shell scripts and the Python commands, thank you for that question. Uh, so if I go to collab.google.research.com like so, let me just connect to the internet here. I'll be able to do the same things I was doing using Jupyter Notebook Classic. Um, I'll be able to do the same things. So, one of the things that I've benefited from myself in the past uh, when learning these things is uh, uh, captive, being a captive audience where you are forced to do things, right? Not really forced, but you at least attempt to do some, some things. It's, at least you, you don't have an excuse to put things off here. So I think it would be nice if we play along with this as we are looking at Python. It won't help if we just uh, say... No, which is why I think the installation will waste time. So we can just connect to the internet and then go to callup.google.com. Um, so maybe we can do this together uh, as a first simple exercise as we are running through this Python code. We we're on the same page. So uh, perhaps I will end up sharing a number of things. Can I suggest that you you go here, please? Uh, so if you go to, and I'll share this just now. There we go. I'll be sharing uh, most of the links here. So just go here for now. Uh, I think that should be able to work, I hope. Because as we're working on some of these things, maybe uh, some people would want to share with us what they've worked on, so we we'll use this. It's just it's an Etherpad installation. This is a collaborative editor. Um, <coughs> uh, and so something else I wanted to mention is uh, don't don't get uh, too excited with it. It's good to be excited with implementation, but it turns out the idea is more important than the the implementation. So when we're looking at these things, right, it's what we're looking at is not really hardcore. There's nothing complex with the programming we are doing, right? Most, most of it. So uh, we must focus on these uh, fundamental ideas we are discussing. I don't know if we've managed to get there. 
if we have, we should be able to find, uh, start sharing some of the things. Um, So just go here and then you'll find most of the things that I'll be sharing there as well, including the link to Google Collaborator, although you can easily Google it up. Right? Uh. <clears throat> so I don't know if you've managed to set up the Google Collab thing and, yeah? Okay, so once you do that, you should be able to see something like this, right? Um, so uh, as a starting point, just click New Notebook. Uh, and then it should be presented with um, uh, a new notebook. So if, if you have uh, an installation, once you install your, your Jupyter notebook, what you can do is there's an option for you to import an existing notebook, right? Uh, so what you would do is you work offline using Jupyter Notebook Classic, like I have been doing, and then within Google Colab, I would import that notebook. And then it's saved. It's like you're saving, just like we save files on, in Google Drive, right? Uh, another interesting thing about what we are doing when you're working in the cloud is, like for me at least, because I have unlimited, and the people from CICT know this, I don't know if this is still the case here, but unlimited storage access. I normally dump a lot of large files here, so it makes it a lot easier to work, use, to work here, right? Because, lo and behold, I have, where are you? Is it because I'm not a, a uh, uh, Okay, it's connecting to runtime enabled files. So I can import uh, data files from Google Drive from within here. Right, so you can create buckets essentially, which is quite nice. <coughs> okay, so if we've done this, then uh, we'll start just to test that this thing works. Maybe we can, before we start our introduction of Python, the, the uh, tradition is always hello world, right? So in Python, the, 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 there's no system to allow to print. All you do is you just type in print in parentheses, because we're working with Python 3 here, so you can mount your drive, you see that. Uh, as a text, hello world. All right, with a, an exclamation mark. And the way you execute, I, I do hope uh, the same thing, shift, enter, right, and then boom, hello world, right. Uh, and also there's a repo, right, uh, a repo, so you can, uh, you can execute uh, mathematical expressions within the print statement itself. Uh, so the hello world should be a nice introduction. I guess before we dive into the Python, it should be straightforward. All right, so if we've, we've done that, then we know that the setup is fine and we're able to follow through with some of the things I'm going to be talking about so we can proceed with this thing. Good stuff. 